All right, today we're going to talk about impressionism. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So as you remember, we discussed realism this past week and the um, underlying tenets of realism, as well as the fact that it was depicting everyday people engaged in everyday activities. Okay, um, so this is the work by Corbet, uh, Burial at Ornan. And Corbet was also known for um, landscapes. Okay, so he would paint these landscapes and they would be just kind of um, normal parts of the landscape. He wouldn't do uh, like a, a very grand sort of mountainous landscape or um, thundering lightning and sky and Anastasia. Um, that was not his style. He would just paint every day, right? Um, what the landscape looks like. And he would use uh, very undramatic scenes. So um, since we're talking about impressionism, we need to start with a brief understanding of the Barbizon school. So the Barbizon school um, likes Courbet's undramatic handling of scenes, um, the handling of the paint, opposition to convention, all of these things appeal to the members of what is known as the Barbizon school. So the Barbizon school, and you can see here works by Rousseau and others in the Barbizon school, um, they would model observe specific non-historical landscapes. So what I mean by non-historical landscape is a landscape like this, as opposed to um, a Poussin. So for instance, right, we saw some Poussin landscapes, but they are very historical. There's a lot of meaning imbued in them. Okay, very classicizing, um, referencing the classical. Okay, so the Barbizon school is not doing that. They are painting scenes out of doors. So this is called en plein air, which means in the open. Um, this is a, a work by Corot, who's a very famous Barbizon painter. And they would pay attention to times of day, to seasons, apologies, cat on keyboard despite having a decoy keyboard for her. Um, okay, sorry. So again, they're painting out of doors. They're painting these not dramatic scenes. They're realistic. They're true to life. They're observing uh, weather, seasons, etc. Okay, so this is the basis for the Impressionists. So the Impressionists, again, are doing things like painting up doors and painting everyday landscapes as opposed to something super dramatic. But they are ignoring traces of historic France that sometimes occur in Barbizon paintings. They're ignoring any element of the sublime. And the Impressionists are not limiting themselves to simply landscapes of actual land, but they also paint cityscapes, landscapes of life in the suburbs, seaside, etc. Um, and the palettes are lightened. So one thing that you may have noticed about the Barbizon school is that these works tend to have a very dark sort of palette. And the Impressionists are all about these lighter colors, right? You very rarely will see much black in these works because what they're doing is they're looking at things like shadows and they're observing that shadows are not actually black. It's a combination of other colors. So Impressionism gets its start in April of 1874. So you have 30 artists who organize an exhibit in the studio of Nadar, who is a photographer. Um, and this includes Monet, Degas, Manet, Pissarro, Renoir, and Cezanne. And this is a gesture of independence from the Salon. So if you remember, for realism, I talked about how Courbet was really breaking away from the Salon and how you would have these paintings just absolutely stacked floor to ceiling, and it would be jam-packed with viewers, and only things that were approved by the Academy could be shown in the Salon, and this was how you made money, and it was like super stressful and um, modulated by essentially the government. So the Impressionists have their own exhibit and this only draws 3,500 visitors instead of the 450,000 that would visit the Salon. Um, so they are organizing their own exhibition, okay? And they hang it in the same way. 
Um, so some characteristics that we're going to see in Impressionism are things like visible brush strokes, ordinary subjects that are showing the transformation of Paris. So it's not going to be political. It's not going to be monumental in the way that neoclassical was and the virtue that neoclassicism was trying to inspire or the sense of awe that romanticism was going for and the sublime. We're not going to see any of that. This is simply an attempt to capture movement as an indication of a fleeting moment. Okay, it's painted in a very quick manner that captures this elusive moment. A lot of it is painted out of doors, so en plein air. And this is made possible because of things like paint in portable paint tubes. So prior to now, we have talked about this a little bit, but you would take um, something that would allow you to get color from it, right? And you would grind it up and this would make pigment. So the really, really rich blue that we've seen is from crushed lapis lazuli stones. And you would mix that with oils and um, you, know, you would create this paste and paint it on. Very labor intensive because you have to grind it and then mix it yourself. And also these are very expensive colors for the pigments. And so you would only mix as much as you could use. And if you had extra, you would put them into basically the equivalent of a balloon. But what they used for balloons would be like a pig's bladder. Okay, so think about the process of grinding these stones and then mixing it with oil and then you have to take any extra and put it into a pig's bladder and tie it up. This is not conducive to painting out of doors. So the invention of these um, tubes like what you get at the store now with the um, metal but it's still flexible and you can roll it up, you can cap it so you can keep using it. So this is a huge labor saver. So um, artists are not having to grind their own pigments. They're not having to worry about preserving it. And so this really, really frees artists from having to be in the studio. Um, and the Impressionists heavily favor immediate observation while excluding literary and symbolic references. And again, they do a lot of landscapes and scene of, scenes of modern life. These are not narrative. Um, so for instance, what we're looking at here is a very famous piece that essentially kicked off Impressionism. This is called Impression Sunrise by Monet from 1872. There is no narrative here. Okay, so what we're looking at is water um, here in the foreground with a couple of boats and reflections. And then in the background, you can see signs of industry. Okay, so think about what we've talked about with cities, right? So when we were looking at the Romantics, we talked about William Blake and the children having to climb in the, um, the chimneys, right? The small children working in factories. So the Industrial Revolution has created heavily packed urban areas that um, have um, tons of people living in them. And so you have squalor and you have the rise of things like steam power, right? And so all of this, there's a lot of pollution. These cities are dirty and unpleasant and everybody is crowded here, but you also have the rise of the middle class or the bourgeois. And so these are people who are um, starting to engage in leisure activities and they're buying fancier clothing that is not made bespoke or for them, but they're buying clothing um, essentially off the rack, which is pretty revolutionary at this time because you either saw a tailor or a dressmaker or you made your own clothing. Okay, so a lot of changes. And what you see here are smokestacks. Okay, so you can see how it's misty, it's morning, um, but you have this element of pollution and you have these big ships and you have the sun rising. Okay, and look how sketchy the reflection of the sunrise is and the impasto included here, right? But this is not pure color. There's white mixed in, there's a darker sort of yellowish orange. Okay. Um, and again, right, look, look at this. So this is a boat here where my cursor is. And below that you see the reflection, but the reflection is not 
black. It is dark, but it is not black. So if you look at a shadow, you'll notice that shadows are not solid black, right? They're made up of a variety of colors. So there is a growing interest in color theory at this time, um, which is combining with these things. And you often see the use of pure intense colors. These are often small scale. Um, and you are seeing uh, concern with finding a way to express the individual sensation. And most of these Impressionists do, in fact, have formal art training. So this is not someone who is unable to create technically skilled art. This is someone who has created technically skilled art and is pushing past that. Okay, so think about where we've come from. We had, um, you know, the Baroque and before that the Renaissance. Um, and remember how we had the Renaissance, which was like idealized bodies and much more realistic than previously. And then we had mannerism, which kind of pushed it to the extent possible with the elongated ele elegant bodies. So what we're seeing here is um, kind of a reaction to what the art world is like at this time. So this is 40 years, no, 30 years after um, photography has made its mark in the world, okay? Um, so we have realism. So you're no longer depicting just the fancy wealthy people, you're depicting everyday life. And then you have photography come along and it accurately captures everything, right? It captures all the details. Um, so you no longer need to have something painted or drawn in order to get an accurate representation, right? So where does art go from here? So the Impressionists are taking that and they're pushing it further. And so they are looking for a way of conveying feelings and um, experiences, right? fleeting moments. So something that is not permanent, right? These are not grand portraits of the king, nothing like that. All right. So um, as I mentioned before, this is from 1872 called Impression Sunrise. And the reason for this title is that a critic saw it and said that it was not an actual sunrise. It was only Monet's impression of a sunrise. Um, which is where the term Impressionism comes from, because it is a very subjective view created by these artists. Not all critics use the term Impressionism in a negative way at that time, though. Um, some of them used it in the sense that they render not the landscape, but the sensation produced by the landscape. Um, and so even the artists themselves start to use the term Impressionism. So in the 1860s, you have artists receiving some recognition at the Salon, um, the Impressionist artists, and approximately 50% of their works are accepted and some are sold, but overall they are struggling, okay? Um, and so in 1863, Napoleon III, in response to complaints about the number of rejects from the Salon, establishes a Salon des Refus, so things that were rejected by um, the Salon. And this creates uh, another, um, another uh, venue, another Salon for exhibiting these artworks. And again, I just want you to get a really good feel for the paint application here. Okay, this is very hurried paint application. This is not um, very smooth and technically flawless. Okay, we're looking at rough, we're looking at scumbling. We're looking at impasto and look at the way these colors are just jumbled together. Um, and I don't know if anyone watches Clueless anymore. My partner made me watch it, which I think he was kind of horrified by it, to be honest. So I don't know why we watched it. Anyway, irrelevant. Um, the idea, I think that um, the main character says that she's like a Monet from far away. She looks good, but up close, it's just a messy jumble of brush strokes. Right, but the idea that these brush strokes become cohesive when you step back and take in the bigger picture overall. Okay, so again, right, think about what we talked about with the influence of the Barbizon school, right? So, undramatic landscapes. 
landscapes that are not showing anything special, but simply everyday life, right? And if you were to look at this up close, it is just um, green, layered on green. But from a ways back, you can tell that this is in fact a weeping willow. Okay, so again, right? These impressions of the feeling that this landscape gives at the time. And so what we're going to see time and again is the same work reproduced over and over, or uh, sorry, not the same work, but the same subject matter, okay? And so what that has to do with is the, um, the weather, the atmosphere, okay? So this is Rouen Cathedral by Monet, and this is from 1893. And so what we're looking at here is the entryway to a Gothic or medieval cathedral. Okay, so here is the doorway with the tympanum here, right? The towers, you can kind of see it. And so we see these painted over and over, slight variations in where the artist is standing. So this is Rouen Cathedral Harmony in Brown, whereas the previous was Harmony in Blue, um, roughly the same time period. And so we see these over and over as the artists try to capture light. They try to capture light sparkling across the surface, right? Um, how fleeting the atmospheric effects are. And so this is something that comes up time and time again. And we're also going to see, um, okay, so I just wanted to show you how many of these there are. There are a lot. We're also going to see an obsession with um, France, okay? Again, another example of um, repetition of the same scene over and over and over. So this is the Houses of Parliament. And we saw the Houses of Parliament. If you think back to Turner's burning of the houses, let me, Turner burning. Yeah, let's try that. Um, so this is the burning of the houses of lords and commons. Okay. Um, so this is the same space. And obviously this is a much more dramatic scene, but this really encapsulates the difference between the romantics here with Turner and the impressionists. Okay. So this is uh, the same building, but this is a monumental event, okay? And you can see the drama here inherent in the fire and the smoke and the waves of flames and the reflections and the crowd, right? You can see all of that. And yet, um, if you were to look at this, it's so still, there's nothing happening. And that's the point, okay? So keep moving here. Again, you can see there's a lot of repetition. Um, and landscapes, okay, so this is haystacks, effects of snow and sun. Um, so Monet is very big into these very repetitive series, okay? Um, all right, so we're also going to see an emphasis on Paris. And Paris um, is redesigned by Napoleon III in 1852, or he is given the task of redesigning the city of Paris to improve sanitation and water supply and distribution of gas and electricity and make the traffic flow better by making wider boulevards. Um, so this is a project that takes 17 years and it creates thousands of jobs, but it displaces thousands of people as well, because in order to make these wide boulevards, you have to destroy the side streets. And so if you were to look at a map of Paris, it's very logical. If you look at other um, medieval cities in Europe, they're not logical. They're very um, irrational, as it were. And that's because of the way that medieval cities would grow. Okay, so with this rise of Paris, we see an increase in leisure. We see um, places like the Louvre being a center of focus. We see sites of spectacles where you would go to see and be seen. Um, so here we have two women who are boating, right? So this is an example of the bourgeois or the middle class um, engaging in leisure activities. This is not something that merits capture because it is, um, an exciting event or because it is monumental, nothing like that. This is just an everyday occurrence. And this is by Bert Morisot, who is a female impressionist. And again, you can see how sketchy 
um, this is, the way the colors are combined, right? You can see the pure colors, the way that they're just kind of slathered on. Um, and from a distance, it becomes very cohesive, but the closer you get, the more sketchy you can tell the um, brush strokes are. So the Impressionists really favor capturing the observed world through color. Um, and they notice that objects in nature are not separated by defined color um, and contour. And so they don't make a distinction between mass, objects, and depth, space. Okay, so here you can see the trees and they all just kind of meld into each other. And you can tell that this is a shadowy area. But again, you don't have distinct crisp delineation between the separate trees. Okay. Um, and this is criticized for um, making formless, insubstantial images um, because of this observation of uh, the lack of contour and preciseness between these various elements. Okay, and so we have, um, we have a wide variety of scenes that are depicted by the Impressionists. It can be scenes of leisure, of the, the bourgeois engaged in sea, um, uh, being at the sea or sunbathing, or it can be a garden, or it can be the river, or it can be a site of industrial pollution, right? So it is simply everyday life. And so you can see how that they are referencing realism, right? With this emphasis on everyday life um, and not going out and seeking something exquisite and sublime and monumental, okay? Um, and in 1869, we have a series of paintings produced by Monet and Renoir um, on a river, on the River Sienne. And this is regarded as the beginning of the mature Impressionist style. So scenes of leisure in a fashionable suburban setting and spontaneity of execution, showing how colors of objects are modified by the effects of light. Okay. Um, and so we have Renoir, who uh, has a very different style from the other Impressionists, um, and his work is very distinct. You can still see how he is, um, has the loose brush strokes and some of the impasto and the scumbling of the Impressionists, but it is much more cohesive and it's very soft. His colors blend and melt into each other. But again, you can see, um, so what look like little polka dots on this fellow are in fact uh, spaces in the, um, the trees overhead, right? Where the light is shining through. And so this is a dappled effect because of the light. And what we're seeing here are, again, the bourgeois engaged in um, just leisure, uh, enjoying themselves. This is a very realistic depiction of a cafe. So this is by Renoir from 1876 and it's Dance at the Moulin de la Galette, okay? Um, so again, right? Very distinctive style. And this is one of the paintings that precipitated the mature Impressionist style. So Impressionism is seen as an anti-academic um, movement in terms of the formal aspects. So again, if we think of um, academic art, right? We think of... Uh, the Nut Gatherers, okay, by Bouguereau, all right? Um, so we have this very technically refined, very smooth, um, oftentimes we'll have religious or mythological subject matter or um, something moralizing or very precious, right? And so this is the style, um, this is 1882. So it's concurrent with the Impressionists. And this piece is actually at the DIA. It's one of their um, most famous pieces. Okay, and compare it with this from 1869. And again, right, this is Renoir. And you can see the influence of Monet on his work, right? Look at these loose kind of squiggly brush strokes. All right, again, the bourgeois, the middle class engaging in leisure in an area where they would go to hang out, have fun 
they would get one, maybe two days a week off. And so they would live it up on the days that they did have off. Um, and so one thing that you will also notice is that some artists are considered impressionists, although they never exhibited with the impressionists because of the emphasis on similar um, similar areas, right? So this is by Manet. So this is the artist who did Olympia, the nude prostitute. And you can see how, again, he's going for the loose brush strokes, the effect of light, the lack of contours, shading, okay, um, just everyday subject matter, profile of a woman. So this is, I believe, his wife um, depicted here, right? She's wearing fashionable clothing. She's heated out of doors. Um, but Monet never actually exhibited with the Impressionists. And we have others who did exhibit with the Impressionists, whose work perhaps does not seem very Impressionist. Um, so this includes uh, Kai Butt, who, here we go, um, so this is Paris Street, rainy day. And so at first glance, this does not look impressionist. So think about these types of brush strokes, right? So this is Monet. Um, we have, let's see, Bridge Over a Pond of Water Lilies by Monet, right? The very loose brush strokes, that's not at play here. So there is some element of slightly sketchy, um, but it's not loose. It is a much more refined application. But if you look at this, you can see why this is Impressionist. Um, so what you're seeing here is Paris, which again, I mentioned had been restructured. And so you can see these very wide boulevards. It's very logical. And look at this figure here, okay? Um, so he's cropped. So think about the way you would take a picture with a camera. Okay, so this is actually very similar to what you might see with a camera. There's no one focus here. It's just a shot of everyday life. And you have the effect of the rain and the shadows, but you're not really seeing very much black. This is cropped, he's cut off, okay? Um, and again, this emphasis on everyday life, modernity, which is modern as the root word, um, and you have everyday people, the bourgeois. Okay, so hopefully you can see how this is an example of Impressionism. Uh, and again, he did exhibit with the Impressionists. Others who exhibited with the Impressionists, who we do not consider Impressionists, are Cezanne, Gauguin, Seurat. So these are post-Impressionists. And the last, Seurat, is a neo-Impressionist. And we'll be talking about them next week. Um, so oftentimes, uh, the idea of someone being an Impressionist can be based on either their motivating principles in the subject matter that they depict, or it could be something as simple as they exhibited with the Impressionist, but that's not always the case. Um, so here we see Pissarro from 1898. Sorry, one last thing about this kaibot. Uh, this is from 1877 and it is in Chicago. I would highly recommend going to see it if you're ever in Chicago at the Art Institute. It's a beautiful piece. Um, okay, actually there is one other that I wanna show you. Wait, 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 yes, no. Okay, sorry. The, uh, the spelling of this one trips me up sometimes. Um, no, okay. Oh my word. Okay, I can't spell, apologies. Okay, here we go. This is what I wanted to show you. Sorry about that. Um, so this is another work by the same artist and it's almost abstracted because it's not entirely clear what you're looking at, um, but it is uh, actually a, a cropped view of um, looking through the railing of a balcony. And you can see through to the street with the horse-drawn carriage. And you can see that the, the application of the paint is quite loose. Um, there's some impasto, but again, right? It's very cropped, etc. And that's a kaibot as well. Um, Pissarro, 1898. So he is another impressionist. And again, you'll notice the cropping of this piece, right? There's no single focus here. 
Um, and it's just everyday life, it's carriages, it's urban, it's modernity, it's the loose brush strokes, it's the emphasis on weather effects, atmosphere, etc. Um, and so we have a couple of camps. Uh, so we have a camp that has artists like Monet and Degas. And so this is uh, artists who are creating this very stage-like scene in which characters act out scenes of cosmopolitan Paris. Um, and they indicate identity for the viewer that's quite close to the character of the artist themselves. So if we go back here, um, so uh, Kaibut is an example of this type of artist and we'll see some Degas as well. Okay, so here's a Degas. And Degas is very preoccupied with depicting ballerinas. Um, he's fascinated by ballerinas, but again, right, the cropping, this sense of a stage-like atmosphere, this more cohesive paint application. So it's not as sketchy and loose as the other types of impressionists. Um, and these types of scenes with this um, stage-like setting and the cropping, right? These allow the viewer to seemingly have direct access to the scene that is portrayed. Okay, so again, Degas, um, this heightening of color Right, so again, you're not seeing um, blacks for the shadows, etc. cetera. Um, just a woman making hats, okay? Um, this is called the tub, and this is an example of influence from Japan and Japanese woodblock prints, okay? Um, Mary Cassatt, who is an American Impressionist female, uh, and she depicts mothers and their children, very tender. Um, and so this is, um, these are Japanese woodblock prints. So this is the sort of thing that impressionists are looking at and it's inspiring them. And so this influence of Japanese prints is called Japanism, okay? Um, and in 1867, you first start to see these woodblock prints at the World Fair in Paris. And you can see that they lack perspective, they lack shadow, they're very flat and stylized. So this is Hoku size um, under the wave off Kanagawa. Okay, and so you see these um, boats with scared figures looking into the waves, right? You can see all of this, um, but they're very abstracted, it's very flat. And you see these very menacing sort of fingers in the wave itself. So you have flat areas of strong color. The subjects are often off center. So again, right? Uh, even though this is Mount Fuji, the great wave, Mount Fuji is very small. It's not the emphasis here. The emphasis is this wave, okay? Um, and so it lacks traditional devices like linear perspective, chiaroscuro, et cetera. And so this is seen by the Impressionists as um, an alternative to the conventional Western means of representation. So if we come back here, you can see that the perspective is off here. We're kind of looking at like a diagonal at the woman, but then we're really looking down on the table, but the objects are like at a diagonal. So the perspective here is off. It's a very shallow space. Um, the foreshortening makes it kind of odd. And so all of this is being taken from Japanese prints. And again, this is called Japanese. Um, okay, so, uh, and it looks like the rest is post-impressionism. So um, a couple of other factors that contribute to Impressionism before we wrap up, and I will just uh, take you to this work by Monet. This is the arrival of the Normandy train from 1877. As I mentioned before, there's a growing interest in color theory and the laws of complementary culture complementary contrasts. There's this desire to work outside of the space of the studio. So en plein air, there's a growing dissatisfaction with salon exhibits because many of these artists are experiencing rejection there. Um, and by the time of the 1886 Impressionist exhibit, which is the last one, many artists are actually beginning to experience success. So this sort of work has become acceptable in mainstream society. 
Total, there were eight exhibits put on by the Impressionists. And 1874, that exhibit was particularly well covered and critics were really relatively supportive of the principle of the independent exhibition, but the work itself, however, not so much. Uh, and it was pretty much a final failure until the last exhibit in 1886. And only one artist exhibited in all, um, all eight exhibits, and that would be Pissarro here, interestingly enough. Um, and artists could not exhibit in these shows if they sent works to the Salon too. Um, so if they wanted to try their hand at submitting something to the bigger salon to see um, greater uh, financial growth, etc., they wouldn't be allowed to exhibit with the Impressionists. So that is a quick and dirty rundown of the Impressionists, and hopefully that gives you a little bit more context for Monet's Water Lilies. Until next time. <laughs>